As you're being seated, uh, I want to thank you for being here. And uh, today's a, a, a little different Sunday for us. We have a, a guest speaker. And we had a wonderful service at, at 9 o'clock. <clears throat> and I want to welcome you to this service. Um, right after this, we have uh, some activities and an event that I'll tell you about later. I hope you can stay uh, for that. But right now, let me just say a word about Gary, uh, and, uh, and, and then I'll invite him to come up. Gary's been speaking on the creation evolution issue since 1990. In uh, 2002, he was invited to join the ministry. That's Creation Ministries International. He was invited to join it full time in Brisbane and eventually became its head of ministry. Uh, then Gary and his family relocated here to America to serve as CEO of C CMI US. Uh, he was also elected to the position of CEO of CMI Worldwide, and uh, we thank the Lord for this ministry. Um, held, he held this position from its inception in 2008 until mid-2016, when he decided to step down and just concentrate on the task of managing the rapidly growing USA office. And uh, one thing about Gary that... that uh, uh, that's interesting and you ought to know and he'll mention this probably at some point this morning he was once a convinced evolutionist but the creation message then had a dramatic impact on Gary's life and he's now a biblical creationist with a heart to communicate this life changing information to the average person uh, uh, on the street Gary has a lot of uh, uh, involved in the ministries, and he's responsible for a lot of scientists. We've had them here, Robert Carter, and, and uh, that's wonderful. But Gary has that heart as, a, as you and I, just person on the street, understanding the truth of creation from a biblical uh, point of view. Uh, he's married to Fran, or Francis, and she helped us organize this event. They have four adult children, and Gary's written several books. Uh, I'm going to ask him to say a word about that. Uh, at some point because it's a wonderful resource. Creation Ministries International is a wonderful, wonderful resource that will help you. Their website, I, I didn't, uh, I'd forgotten the number of articles, he'll probably say this, but over 14,000, 14,500 articles at creation.com. And I got to tell you, I told him last night as we met, I go back to that time after time again. And, and as a pastor recently, I came across or was confronted with a question about starlight. And uh, the first thought I had was I'm going to that website and try to study it and learn about it. And the thing about that website, it's going to always point you to the, the scripture. And that's our authority. We have one authority and that's the word of God. And so we are so humbled, glad uh, to have uh, Gary with us. Gary, come on up. We've been praying for you. Let's welcome him to Brooklyn, New York. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Well, being that I'm an Aussie, you'd be disappointed if I didn't say good day. <laughs> so as you can tell, I have a, a deep southern accent. And that's because our head office is in Atlanta, Georgia, which is actually uh, where I live now. So this morning I'm going to race along and talk about why this creation evolution issue uh, is important. You know, I've been in ministry for actually uh, 30 years this year. I started as a volunteer. And uh, obviously as a ministry we get literally thousands of questions, which is why there are thousands of articles on our website. We call ourselves an information ministry to produce information to equip you to be salt and light for the culture. Firstly, to be salt and light in your own families. I believe evangelism starts at home if we're going to send our young ones out uh, into the world. But what do I mean by that? Well, just indulge the little Aussie this morning. I'm going to do a snap poll, all right, but I'm not going to pick anybody out. Just tell me, if you've ever you know, wandered yourself or you've had friends or children come home from school or your grandchildren and they say, you know, if the Bible's true and we all came from Adam and Eve, who did Cain marry? You ever had that one? Or maybe you're talking to a colleague at work and if the Bible's true and we all started from Adam and Eve and he says, Where, what about all the different races as people think there is such a thing? What about dinosaurs? You know, we're told there was this great age of dinosaurs millions of years ago. How come I can't see those in the scripture? What about this one, ladies and gentlemen? I think the number one reason people give to excuse God, all right, as excuse him as in he doesn't exist, 
uh, a problem for the Christian faith, they think, is this. If God is a God of love, why does he allow all the bad things in the world? Why is there death and suffering? Now, if you've ever received or had questions like that, just pop your hands in the air and show me, please. Keep them up. Come on, be brave. Now, I just want you to turn around and have a look. <laughs> There's about 80% of you have put your hands up, and I only asked you four questions. <laughs> But people have dozens of questions in this area, you see. So we've just already given an example of why CMI exists to answer these types of questions. And our website there, I mean, that's a very difficult website to remember, isn't it? Creation.com. So when you see on the TV and they say, look, here's this latest ape man fossil from Africa as they did last year. They found a cave in South Africa, 27 or so missing links. Here is evidence, they claim, that apes evolved, you know, into humans about two million years ago. How do you deal with that? As Pastor Ray says, right, he's a pastor. He would go to a website like this to get information. And it's all free. You can type questions into the search engine there. Uh, you know, what about carbon-14 dating, something like that? And you can get answers for it. And because there's so many here, and we don't want to cause big lines at the end, we're going to do something in the service to get you connected with information. We have a free email news called Infobytes. To give you an example, you can see the guy at the top there, Steve Irwin. Remember him? His zoo was just a couple of hours north of where I lived in Brisbane. And when he was killed by that stingray, lots of people contacted us and said, well, why does a god of love design stingrays that kill people? How would you answer that? You see, the poet Tennyson said, nature is red in tooth and claw. We see things tearing each other apart. Is that how God created it? No. We go back to Genesis chapter 3. It helps us understand there's a fallen world that we live in. That's why bad things happen to us, ladies and gentlemen. When we look out, even though we see incredible beauty, when we see things like earthquakes and tsunamis and bad things, it should be a reminder that something is wrong. It should as actually get us to question our mortality because we don't know when these things are going to happen. And that's why I said, even the first service, that today is the day of salvation. So you can see at the bottom of that article, we just put a, a little link. And here's the thing. Within 10 days, people like you on our electronic mailing list, you read it, you equip yourselves, and you forward it. Within 10 days, that became the most visited article ever on our website. How easy is that for evangelism? Just to share that information, particularly when something is major news like that. So uh, Felix and Edmund are going to come around in a moment and pass these sign-up sheets for our free email news. All I need is your name, your email address, and your zip code, because I can always let you know when there are events in your area. And we're going to start here, and if you could pass them along to the other side, hold them up when you're finished, and they'll grab them off you, because we'll need them back at the end. Thank you very much. And I'll get on with the major talk. The argument, ladies and gentlemen, about creation evolution is actually not an argument about science. As a ministry, we have offices in seven countries. I think we employ more scientists in the world than any Christian ministry. And I don't say that to boast, but to point out, boys and girls, listen, our PhDs, they got their degrees in the very same secular universities as their evolution-believing counterparts. This issue is ultimately a battle of our worldviews, our belief systems, and I've depicted them here like two trees. The Lord Jesus spoke a lot about trees, and he said trees will produce certain fruit. I'm going to use his analogy today. And if you can look at the screen, notice that tree on the left-hand side. Look what it's called, humanism. Humanism is a concept that says man is the ultimate authority in this world. We're kind of the top of the food chain, if you like. Now, why do people believe in that? Well, every belief system has a foundation. Notice what this, uh, the soil is that this tree is planted in? Evolution. Evolution is a concept that there was a big bang 14 billion years ago, and you and I are just a product of time and chance. Now, think about it. If people believed that, that means there's no God, no creator to be accountable to. So hang on, let's look at some of the problems for the church, right? Depicted up here. Racism, abortion, gay marriage, euthanasia. But actually, I submit to you, they're not the problems. They are symptoms or the fruit of a foundational problem, which is humanism with its roots in evolution. See, if there's no God to be accountable to, who's to say it's wrong to go and sleep with another man? 
Now contrast that there with the tree of Christianity. Someone tell me, everything you and I need to know about the Christian faith, the nature of God, our need for salvation, where did we get that information from? Bible. Hold it up, thank you. The Bible, God's Word. And if you subscribe to that as your belief system, well, guess what? We should produce fruit in accordance with that. We'll believe in the sanctity of life. God made us in His image. In fact, He says He knew us before we were even formed in the womb. We'll believe in uh, racism is wrong. We'll love thy neighbor as thyself. Why? Well, guess what? Modern genetics has caught up with what the Bible has always said of one blood he made all nations of men. All right? Every single human being on this earth, every variety of human being, we now know we could fit into an original human couple. We are over 99% genetically alike. The alleged racial differences are less than 1% of our genome. You see... Most people believe in evolution for one simple reason. This sounds a bit cliched, but it's as true 30 years ago when I started as is today. That's all we're taught. And I can't emphasize this enough. We think we're in the church and our young ones are here and, and they're nice and secure. But tomorrow, not maybe or perhaps, tomorrow in the public schools and the colleges, they will be taught evolution as a scientific fact, ladies and gentlemen. So respectfully, that's my challenge to you. How can kind of one hour on a Sunday morning compete with 35 hours a week? How many weeks a year and how many years of schooling when they're going to be taught an anti-Christian worldview? And you know, a lot of us, myself included, when I first became a Christian, I was an evolutionist, and I said, well, there might be many ways to interpret Genesis. I thought the science of evolution was so strong, and you know, we can't really know what happened, and yeah, it's not important. Just believe in Jesus. But then what happens when you get those questions, like I mentioned at the beginning, right? So check this out. This is very important. Do you know there are over 100 references to the book of Genesis in the New Testament? And specifically Genesis 1 to 11. Now what are those Genesis 1 to 11 chapters? That's creation, the fall, the flood, the dispersal after the flood, the Tower of Babel. There are 60 references. Every single New Testament author references Genesis 1 to 11. Every Genesis 1 of 11 chapter is referenced in the New Testament. The Lord Jesus referenced Genesis 1 of 11 on 16 occasions. Do you think they thought it was important? <laughs> well, let's take one of those fruits on the tree, what they call gay marriage or same-sex marriage. How would we answer that today's culture? We go back to creation. Because you can read in Mark 10, 6, it says, uh, the Lord Jesus speaking, he says, have you not read? What do you think he meant when he said, have you not read? He's talking about the law, wasn't he? The Torah, the, the first five books. He said, at the beginning of creation, God, the creator, made them male and female. Therefore, what God has made, let man, humanism, not separate. So his authority argument for what for defined marriage is what the creator made in real time, in real space. Uh, if you've got those boards, by the way, hand them up so the guys can pick them up off you, please. Thank you. You see, here's this evolutionary tree of life, they call it. I've kind of caricatured it, but you've all seen pictures like this. Here we are at the bottom. We're nothing more than evolved pond scum. Kind of makes you feel special, doesn't it? Millions of years of death and struggle, survival of the fittest. Now, why have I caricatured it like that? You see, they call that an evolutionary tree of life. But just take a look. See any life going on? Evolution, ladies and gentlemen, if you know anything about it, it's all about death. It's culling out the weak, getting rid of the unfit. In the evolutionary scenario, if God did it, he created millions and millions of creatures all just to die out, to have no ultimate purpose. And human beings, here we are, you and I are at the top. We're the ultimate top of the evolutionary tree. Your average civilised American there, all right? Or Australian. <laughs> now think about that. The, the Bible has a different view of death. It says it's an enemy, an enemy to be destroyed. As I said earlier, when we see bad things, our loved ones get cancers, it should be a reminder to us something is wrong with this world. But evolution under the, uh, death under the evolutionary scenario is the saviour. So yeah, people die, they're weak, get over it. That's what people like Richard Dawkins say. See, that's the basis of what we call a non-Christian worldview. And what is a worldview? You've all heard that word, but let me point it out. It's like a set of glasses. Here we pictured it like a telescope. But it's basically a lens 
which everybody, yep, everybody, uses to interpret their world, even our children, once they reach the age of understanding. And I think I can distill our worldview down to those famous three questions we all talk about. You know those big three questions? I go like this. Where do we come from? Why are we here? What's our meaning and purpose? And the last one is what happens to us when we die. Let's go through these two scenarios under, um, with those three questions. If evolution is true, tell me, is there any meaning and purpose to life ultimately? No, you live, you die, that's it. What about life after death under that scenario? They burn you up, put you in the ground, that's it. But if the Bible's true, God is creator, there is meaning and purpose to our life. Oh, by the way, the decisions you make in this life, they're going to affect where you spend eternity. But do you know why I did that, ladies and gentlemen? Because questions two and three will always be determined by what you think about question one. Created or evolved? Where did I come from? And would it be fair to say that anybody who has ever thought or can think has had to consider those three questions with number one at its foundation? So you're starting to see why I'm saying this is a foundational issue, ladies and gentlemen. The creation evolution argument is not a side issue. I believe, in fact, it's the issue of all issues facing the church today if we're to communicate the relevance of the Christian faith and the Bible. Now, just by way of my introduction, I'm kind of going to give you a bit of bad news, all right? I'm about to show you the results of a Christian research organization called Barna Research. Some of you will have heard about them. They're very famous here in the States. And in a cross-denominational survey of teens in the church, so let me preface that again, young men and women in Christian families sitting in our pews, confidentially those teens revealed that only one in three of them intended to continue in the Christian faith after they left home. So they're already sitting there saying they've made up their minds they were going to leave. I'm gonna, I could show you statistics from virtually every denomination like that. I'll refer to that later. And that's because of the, ev of the education that they're getting in in the public realm. It's causing a disconnect. So like the student says here, you seem a bit down. That science class of yours went for ages. What happened? Our teacher says we're nothing special. We came from pond scum. We're just evolved apes. He says, so what are they teaching in your next class? And she says, self-esteem. <laughs> Many a true word spoken in jest. Okay, so this is very important. What are we going to do about the science? See, when you and I hear the word science, and of course you hear the word evolution and science in the same sentence, I think most of us think about what we would call a very well-defined area of science called operational or experimental science. The type of science that gives us the technology we kind of have today. Now that differs to events whether they're creation or evolution, that allegedly happened in the past. We'd call that historical science or origin science. Let's take a closer look at it. Operational science deals with experiments you can do in the present. You can repeat them, test the results. If I wanted to test the theory of gravity today, right, I could climb up on the church roof and take a nice dive off the side. Of course, I could do it in the present. I wouldn't be around to repeat it, but um, <laughs> you folks could observe the results. Yes, gravity really works. But what about the idea that, you know, humans evolved from apes two million years ago, or there was a big bang 14 billion years ago, or dinosaurs turned into birds 65 million years ago? Anybody see that? Can you repeat it? Can you test it? See, it falls outside of the realms, what you and I commonly understand as science. All right? Historical science, evolution, is full of these alleged one-time events that nobody ever saw. They must have happened once upon a time. That puts it in the realm of faith, belief. Now, I mention this because I love to tell this story. A few years ago in uh, South Africa, I was there on a ministry tour, and a, a young man had been brought along, a non-believer, and he got very angry, and he got into my face at the end of the meeting, and he said, you creationists, you talk about operational science. He says, but you ignore examples of it. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, fossils. <laughs> If I had a dollar for every time somebody mentioned fossils to me. He said, we know fossils take millions of years to slowly form. Therefore, your idea of what he called, you know, he called a young earth, I call it the biblical age of the earth, is blown out of the water by the very science you just spoke about. <laughs> How would you answer that? Well, I showed him this picture, a very famous picture. This is a, an ichthyosaur. I'll wait for my signer to spell that one out. 
ichthyosaur. There we go. This is an extinct marine reptile, and you can see what's really neat about it. Check that out. There's the baby coming out of the birth canal. Now, I'll tell you a little story here, mums. Uh, we've got four adult children. When my wife was in labour with our firstborn, we lived in a very rural part of Australia, and she got into trouble in labour. And we had to put her on something called a flying doctor. It's an air ambulance, and they had to fly her up to the city. And 37 hours later, she gave birth. You think that's a long time, but what about this poor creature slowly giving birth over millions of years <laughs> while it's slowly being fossilised, you reckon? So when you see that picture, instinctively you can understand that something rapid and catastrophic has happened to it in the process of giving birth, right? And yet when I went to school, this is how I taught how fossils were formed. By the way, you've got these at elementary age in this country now. I've seen them in books here. And if you can follow the pictures, Here's old Freddy Fish on the left swimming along and he dies and he sinks to the ocean floor. Now that's what I just accepted and believed for many years until a, there was a fundamental problem with that pointed out to me. Anybody know why? Well, let me ask you, do fish sink to the ocean floor when they die, you think? They generally float, don't they? Go home. Boys and girls, ask mum and dad tonight if you can do the experimental scientific method. You put a teaspoon of cyanide in the goldfish bowl and find out whether Goldie sinks or floats, all right? It's Australian humour, sorry, but anyway. So uh, notice while this fish is lying on the ocean floor, look what they're saying. See these high mountains on the right? They've disappeared. That's called uniformitarianism. The present is the key to the past. They take s current slow erosion rates and they extrapolate that back for tens of millions of years and sediments are carried out, gradually bury the fish, turn it into a rock, and then the process starts again. That's how we get that geologic column they claim we see in our textbooks. But how do you get a fossil like that using that process? You can't, can you? Look at the screen. Here's old Freddy Fish swimming along. You're going to need a lot of mud and a lot of water in a short amount of time, and before long, you can bury them in those layers and get yourself a rapid fossil. Now you might be thinking, come on Gary, that's a bit simplistic. Yes, things can be buried quickly, but it's called fossilization or technically permineralization where the organic material is slowly replaced and turned to stone. That's what takes millions of years. Well, it doesn't. To get rapid fossils, you just need the right set of conditions. Look at the screen. Here's a fossilized hat. This was buried in a volcanic explosion in New Zealand and 20 years after the initial eruption they found this cabin and this hat along with other artefacts that were buried had turned into pieces of solid rock in less than 20 years. You just need the right set of conditions, right cementing conditions to get a rapid fossil. I suppose you can say it evolved into a hard hat, there you go, but anyway. <laughs> Look at this one from my home state of Western Australia, the largest state. You could probably fit Texas in there about four times over, but we only have uh, less than two million people living in the whole state. And right up in the far northwest, the outback, the owner of a trailer park saw the solid rock ring exposed in the sand at low tide. And he shipped it down to us in Perth, where I was living at the time, and we broke it open. Well, what do you think it was? Anyone want to have a guess? Yeah, lots of people say a tyre, but check this out. It was a roll of fossilised fencing wire. Can you see the individual strands of wire on the end? So precisely fossilised, we could measure the gauge of the wire, number eight gauge. And then he remembered when workers were going through refencing the properties, throwing the old rolls into the ocean, hoping they would decay. Remember, you just need the right set of conditions to get a rapid fossil. But it's not only fossils, rocks can form quickly. Family walking along a beach in Australia, they said they saw that rock on the ground there and he said he kicked it over and got a surprise because inside it was a toy car. So fossils and rocks can form quickly under the right conditions. But here's the thing. It's the rocks and the fossils in them that have been cited as evidence for millions of years of evolution on the earth. Do you see this? Was anybody there to see those rocks laid down, those fossils form? No. And remember this, it's because creationists and evolutionists, we have the same facts. We've got the same rocks, we've got the same fossils to look at, 
but we come to differing conclusions about how they arose because of our set of glasses, our starting assumptions. We've already made our mind up before we ever look at the facts. Now, most of you probably don't believe in evolution, but in my experience, a lot of Christians, we struggle with the concept of the earth only being thousands of years. We get that age from the scriptures, okay? That's where it clearly comes from. But then we hear billions, and there's such a disconnect. We think, well, how can it be? I'm going to show you, because most people don't know, where the idea of millions of years comes from. And helping you understand this, hopefully, will help you this morning. It comes from the world's geology, the rock layers. And I'm going to use the Grand Canyon here as an example. Now, if you can see in the canyon, that screen's a bit light there, but um, in the canyon, we've got these alternating wide bands of strata. You can see some are light, some are dark. And in them are things called sedimentary layers. And it's believed, like I showed you with the picture before, that water washes in sediments or they're blown in by wind, and each layer might take a year to form. And in the Grand Canyon, they've got tens of millions of those thin layers, so they assume they're looking at tens of millions of years of Earth's history. So you get my point? That's where it comes from. Now, what do we find in those layers? Often we find fossils. So they say that's a record of evolution over the Earth, during the time it took those rock layers to lay down. And then we look at the Colorado River. And judging by the very slow erosion rates today, and then they look at the depth of the canyon and they say, wow, it must have taken 20 million years to erode the canyon. That's what they look at, and that's where the millions of years come from. It's not radiometric dating or anything like that. Well, I'm going to show you something now that turned me from an old earth evolutionist into a Bible-believing creationist, and some of you will be familiar with the events in Mount St. Helens in Washington State. One of the most well-documented catastrophic events in modern history, you can go onto Netflix and watch documentaries or YouTube. See how the mountain was venting there? There were many earthquakes going on, they evacuated the area, and when it did explode, check that out, it didn't blow its top, <laughs> it blew its side. One third of the volcano erupted and it blew lumps as big as a city block over six miles from the blast site. But you know what? This is just a baby when we consider some of the geologic events that must have happened in Earth's history. But in the aftermath of the initial eruption, if you look at the screen, it laid down bands of strata. Remember how I showed you at the Grand Canyon? There they are. There's a lady at the bottom for scale. But check out that middle section there. This is what we're interested in. Here's a close-up. Finely laminated sedimentary layers. Now, the conventional way we've been taught to interpret those is one per year. Well, in that 22-foot band of strata, there are thousands of layers. Did they take thousands of years to lay down? No, they were laid down precisely in three hours on June 12, 1980. There you go. And you think the bottom one would be older than the top. No, they're actually all the same age because the layers form this way, not one on top of one another. It's the sorting of the granules as they're mixed up. They self-sort. There's the dates for the other two bands of strata there. So when you go back to Mount St. Helens today, there are canyons all over the place. Now let's just do a bit of a self-check here because if I said, well, how, does that, how would that canyon form? We've all been taught, even though we're not scientists, that this little river, the North Fork of the Toodle River, well, that must have ebbed and flowed over a long period of time and slowly eroded the canyon. Fair comment? Well, this is called Engineers Canyon. You know why? Because Army Corps engineers diverted water from Spirit Lake, which was nearby, into what was a little gully at the time, and they eroded that canyon in just a few months. And don't think the material was soft and washed away. The floor of the canyon is solid basalt, or volcanic rock. And you can see what are called striations, which is the scouring of the rock where it's been eroded by fast-flowing mud and water. So the key point here, ladies and gentlemen, you see, it's not a little bit of sediment, a little bit of water over a long period of time. It's a lot of water, a lot of sediment over a short amount of time can do an incredible amount of geologic work. By the way, let me show you, see this uh, on the screen, right up in the top left-hand corner, you can see a little side canyon. They call that um, Little Grand Canyon because it's a 140th scale of the Grand Canyon. 
is a bigger look at it. Little Grand Canyon is not so little, is it? Well, you know what? I wish I could tell you that one took several months to form, but um, actually that was formed in less than 24 hours as a result of a giant mud flow. Catastrophism. You see, remember I said, okay, the geologic column, these are the epochs of time as represented by the rock layers, and they say all these organisms were captured in them, so that's a record of evolutionary biology on the Earth. But as I said, were they there to see them laid down? See, it's true, all over the Earth we have thousands and thousands of feet of sedimentary layers with dead things in them. They say millions of years of Earth's history. But if we put our biblical worldview glasses on, is there another event in the Bible you think could explain some of that? Now, I'll give you a clue. It takes lots of water. Okay, it lasted a year. <laughs> the flood. The great flood of Noah's time. From what we observe today, we know that that ordering of the layers can take place through catastrophic events. See, all that stuff, ladies and gentlemen, comes from Creation Magazine. At the end, I'm going to give you an opportunity to get that. And can I say, um, we don't charge a speaking fee to come. We speak in over 300 churches every year to bring you this information that's in the books. We're faith-funded to do that. The magazine's got no advertising. There's even a children's section in it. So again, I want you to read it. Go and take it on the lunch table at work and just leave it there for someone to pick up. But I want to talk about these six days of creation. This is kind of the thorny one I find most of us stumble on. We, we try to come up with all sorts of ideas to insert the millions of years into scripture. And I, when I first got saved, I thought I was really clever. I found 2 Peter 3, 8, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. But if you read on, it says, a thousand years are like a day. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, actually, that would be a case of using a passage out of context because it's not talking about creation. It's talking about the patience of God. He's not willing that any should perish. If you're here for the first talk, he's outside of time. You know, something very, still very popular in this country is called the Gap Theory. And it was based on a study Bible that came out in the 50s called the Schofield Study Bible. And he said the word uh, here, you know, where it was, could also be rendered became. And if you're not familiar with it, it goes like this. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And then between verse 1 and then verse 2, which is the filling of God's creation in six days, days they inserted a big gap of time, millions or billions of years. Now, why did they do that? Because they deferred to a secular, what do I mean by secular? Non-Christian interpretation of the rocks. And they said, well, there's millions of years. There's evidence. We've got to put that in the Bible. Right? That's why they did it. But then they had a problem. Because Noah's flood's not till chapter 6. And guess what's in those rocks? Remember I said? Fossils. So they came up with something called Lucifer's flood, that Lucifer fell before Adam and Eve, right? There was this Lucifer's flood, and God judged Lucifer, and that's where all the rocks and the fossils come from. See how you get yourself in theological knots? <laughs> well, let me ask you, can anybody give me chapter and verse where I'd find Lucifer's flood in Scripture, please? Anybody? Is it in there? No. See, that's called eisegesis. That's where you add into Scripture. Exegesis is the correct hermeneutical approach where you test Scripture with Scripture. Let's do that this morning. We go to Exodus 20.11. And it says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. By the way, that's verse 1.1 one, one of Genesis. And notice there's no period and no gap. The sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Heavens and earth, everything in six 24-hour days. By the way, how do I know they're 24-hour days? Well, this is a very famous passage of Scripture because it's actually one of the Ten Commandments that I just read. <laughs> and it says about those commandments, they were inscribed by the finger of God in tablets of stone. Right up there with thou shalt not murder and thou shalt not steal. I mean, do we have a problem with any of those other commandments? I mean, we don't work for six million years and rest for one, do we? They're clearly 24-hour days. There are all these different interpretations, and I'm just going to mention them because I know most of us have, have kind of toyed with these. You know, people say there was a local flood. We don't see global floods today. There's never a global flood. But again, the language of Scripture, the high heavens, or the high mountains covered. Noah took somewhere between 70 to 100 years to build this massive ship. The dimensions are given in Scripture. 462 feet long, 70 feet wide, 60 feet high, three decks, 
Why did he take all that time and trouble to build this massive ship to escape a local flood? I mean, he could have packed a suitcase and walked off to another country in that time. Why were birds on the ark? Remember at the end, they released a dove several times until dry land actually appeared, clearly meant to be local. Theistic evolution is the idea that God used evolution. He kind of lit the fuse of the Big Bang, took his hands off the wheel. I want to mention this. Progressive creation, and it's not to disparage, but you have to be careful when someone calls themselves a creationist today. It's a ministry very influential in our colleges called Reasons to Believe. Dr. Hugh Ross, he says there was a Big Bang and he believes in soulless ape men before Adam. Uh, framework hypothesis, this is a view that's popular in colleges, that Genesis is kind of poetry, not meant to be take, taken as real history. Uh, the gap theory I mentioned, but let me deal with this one, the day-age theory. Could the days in Genesis be millions or billions of years each? In fact, that's what the progressive creationists believe. Because they say the word day in English, which is yom in Hebrew, they say it can mean an indefinite period of time. And you know what, that's actually correct. But it's a bit of a bait and switch to say that's what it means in Genesis. Because we always understand the meaning of words from the context they're used in. Let me simplify this for you. Uh, another, another survey coming up, all right? If I said to you, it took me three days to, bli to fly from Brisbane, Australia to JFK, how many 24-hour days have I spoken about? Someone, quick. Good, thank you. The reason I wanted you to do it quickly, I didn't want to give you time to think about it. You didn't need time to think about it because when I put the, a number, it's called an ordinal, in front of the word day, I just defined the context for you. 24-hour day. And if I said, hey, great to be here with you this morning, this evening I'm going to be speaking in another church. You know, the evening and the morning in context, I'm talking about our parts of a 24-hour day. So let me change the context on you now. I'd like to tell you a story about something that happened back in my father's day. How many 24-hour days am I speaking with? <laughs> See how I can change the context of the word day. But what is the context in Genesis? So we start in Genesis 1 verse 5, God called the light day, darkness he called night, there was evening, there was morning, there was one day. Three definers of the context, ladies and gentlemen. Guess what? There's more. There's evening, there's morning, there's a second day. There's evening, there's morning, there's a third day. Are you starting to see a pattern here, by the way? Evening, morning, a fourth day. I think God might be trying to tell us something. I don't know about you. Evening, morning, a fifth day. Am I starting to annoy you yet? Evening, morning, six days. But I didn't write it. <laughs> God's word, defined three times over, six times in each verse. I mean, clearly, he indicated they were 24-hour days. And you know, what's the problem, <laughs> honestly? We sing those songs about the universe, and if you were here, I talked about how there are hundreds of billions of galaxies, all containing hundreds of billions of stars. He determines a number, he calls them all by a name, but you couldn't have done it in six 24-hour days, God, because scientists have said the world is... 4.5 billion years old. How do they know that? Can they know that? No. They just interpret geology incorrectly, ladies and gentlemen. What about that word yom, day? In the Old Testament, outside of Genesis 1, check this out, day and number appears 410 times. Evening and morning without the word day. Evening and morning with the word day. Look at the screen. Now, all these different combinations of the word day, evening, morning, number, it appears 523 times. Nobody questions any one of those as anything but a 24-hour day. It's only in Genesis where they question it. <laughs> hmm. That's not the right hermeneutical approach, is it? See, at the end of day six of creation... Do you remember each day God says it was good, 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 and day six he said it was very good. In fact, the Hebrew word or expression is tov miod, which means perfection, completion, finished. He's finished his work. Now, here's where the rubber meets the road, because remember I said all around the world we do see thousands of feet of sedimentary layers with rock layers in them. And if the evolutionist interpretation is right, that's a record of death and pain and disease and suffering of the earth on the earth over millions and billions of years. So would Adam have been stood on this fossil graveyard beneath them and God says, yeah, that's all very good. Is death good? No. Death's an enemy, isn't it? 
And that famous passage in Romans 5.12, what does it say? Sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. There was no death and bloodshed before Adam. It came about as a result of Adam. You see, now let me just recap here. Because even if you don't believe in evolution, but if you try to add millions of years to the scripture, the millions of years comes from the rock layers. There are dead things in those rock layers. Guess what we're just doing? We're just putting death before the fall. Now it becomes a gospel issue. You might not have realized that. You see, by the way, I'm no greenie, <laughs> but I do recognize this as God's creation. He told us to subdue the earth. He gave us dominion over it. We should look after it in, in the context that we're recognizing it's his and be good stewards. But guess what? We messed it up. And even though we messed up, God's creation, it belongs to him. He sends a rescue mission from heaven to pay the penalty of death that was due you and I for messing it up. See, here we are. We're on this mud ball spinning in space. Is there anything you and I can do to save ourselves? No, but the creator himself made a way. A rescue mission, I like to call it. You know, that's called grace, isn't it, Pastor? We commonly know, call that as unmerited favour, that you and I got what we didn't deserve. And people want to know if God's a God of love. <laughs> isn't that an incredible story of love? But you see how it doesn't make sense unless we go back to Genesis. And, we, and this is what we want to do. Should we take Genesis history literally? Well, if Genesis is not real, literal history with a literal, very good creation, with a literal Adam and Eve, and if sin did not literally enter the world through their actions, then you and I literally don't need to be saved from anything. Wow. You wonder why creationists are dogmatic about the age of the earth. <laughs> because the age of the earth, as I said, comes from those rock layers and it puts death before Adam. By the way, if most of those geologic layers that I showed you in the geologic column were laid down by Noah's flood, remember I said before the flood lasted 12 months. There's no time for revolution to happen. There's no time to turn you know, apes into humans over millions of years. Ladies and gentlemen. It all disappears when we understand what we're looking at out there. And here's the good news. If God's the creator described in Genesis, he's going to do it again. <laughs> what we call a restoration. Check this out, Revelation 21. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There should be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. Here's the very last chapter in the whole Bible, Revelation 22. And it's talking about the new Jerusalem. It says, in the midst there's the tree of life. Did you realize that? And there should be no more pain no more curse. Where did the curse first enter in? Back in Genesis chapter 3. And here's the very last verse in the Bible saying our sovereign God is going to have his way. A restoration. No more death, no more pain. And the curse is done away. That's the unity of scripture, ladies and gentlemen. Now if you believe God used millions of years of death and suffering to create, well I hope you're looking forward to that in the new heavens and earth, right? <laughs> Doesn't make sense, does it? In fact, I don't even think it takes six days. Because when I read the book of Revelation, it says, and behold, I saw a new heavens and earth. Boom, there it is. How can he do that? Because he's the creator, ladies and gentlemen. He's the creator. How can he, how can he raise the dead? Because he's the author of life. Water into wine? When you've just created the heavens and the earth in six days. It's a party trick. And it was at a party, it was at the wedding at Cana. <laughs> so you remember I showed you those statistics, if I haven't convinced you. I live in Atlanta, that's the heartland of the Southern Baptists. I pass 13 churches on my way to work every morning. And they say they're, they're losing 88% of their young ones. Right? Well, I mentioned in the first talk, this has been written about, and if I could be blunt with you as an Aussie visiting, you know, particularly in the South, and... We kind of live in the Bible Belt, this church culture, and I show those statistics and it grieves me that every parent, they say, well, it's not my son or daughter. You know, they're excited for the Lord, they can't wait to get to youth group, but I tell you, so many come up to me and say, that statistics, that's my son or daughter. What, what did we do wrong? 
Well, it's not we necessarily did anything wrong, we just probably didn't do enough or weren't aware of what they were going to encounter in higher education. So a couple of years ago, I took a small film crew and I went onto college campuses around Atlanta. And uh, as I stood there, as the students came past, I asked four questions, that was all. And the first question was, were you raised in the church or not? If they said no, we let them walk on by one of these young men and women who said they were raised as Christians. And the second question was, when you were in uh, creation or evolution, what's true? That was it. That's all I asked. And out of the hundreds of students I surveyed, only five said they still believed in creation. Five. I take no pleasure in, ladies and gentlemen, telling you I've been doing this a long time. I knew exactly what I was going to get. But I wanted these young people to say it for themselves, to wake us up. The next question, the third question, when you were in the church, did your pastors, parents, leaders, anybody show you the wealth of scientific evidence we have today to support biblical creation? And every single student who said they were raised in the church but now believed in evolution, every single one said they'd never been shown anything. They were quite clear about it. The last question was, do you still attend church today? And all those students who believed in evolution, except for one young man, and we, we put him in the video, no longer attends church. The handful of kids who said they still believed, they'd all been shown information, and every single one of them still attended church today. I kept saying this is a foundational issue, ladies and gentlemen. Can't get more foundational than those young people saying it for themselves. We don't get into politics. By the way, there's, you can go to creation.com forward slash fallout. There's a trailer there to watch that. But I do love what Professor Mike Adams says on uh, this website. He says, if Christianity dies in America, it will not be for a lack of the evidence of its truthfulness. He says it will be for a lack of the dissemination of the evidence of its truthfulness. Creation is not allowed in the public realm. So, guess whose job it is? <laughs> it's ours. It's our job to share the information. And as I said before, you know, I think in my experience, we get intimidated when we have those questions. If someone hits you with a question you don't answer, like they did with pastor, you go to creation.com, print it out. It's not your job to save people. You can't save anyone, neither can I. But you just can share information in love and truth. And it becomes God's problem, <laughs> right? But we've got to get through those mental stumbling blocks you know, when I talk about evidence, if I could just digress, it's not even just creation and science evidence today. Did you realise we have more manuscript evidence today than we had 100 years ago? Because with ISIS in the Middle East, they've been burning books and destroying monasteries, and there's a ministry in this country that are going there trying to digitise Greek manuscripts. And they're going to some of these ancient monasteries and they know that Codex XYZ492B is there and when they pull it off the shelf and they find more copies they didn't even know we had. So we're not getting further. When the skeptic says, oh, you've got copies of copies of copies, we're not getting further away from the truth. You can confirm that the English translation you have in your hands faithfully renders what God wanted to communicate to us today. This is such an exciting time, ladies and gentlemen, to be a Bible-believing Christian but most people don't even know all this stuff exists. And again, that's why we go to churches. Remember our website, 12,500 fully searchable articles. We have a weekly TV show there. We're going to be starting live podcasts in a couple of months. Go and listen to it on your way to work or something like that. But Creation Magazine is our number one resource. This goes to over 110 countries around the world, and we've done it for 42 years. We've never taken a dollar for advertising. All right, so it's an equipping and evangelistic resource. What sort of information? It's a family mag. It's a glossy mag, which is why I think it works. But uh, I mentioned the age of the Earth comes from the rocks. And what about radiometric dating? Well, this piece of volcanic rock, we know the age when the volcanic rock formed was 50 years. And we sent that off to a radiometric dating lab, and you can see it came back with an age of 1.35 million years. So the science of measuring what's in it is correct, but the age is an assumption based upon decay rates, etc. Um, look at this, when people think fossils take millions of years, a fossilised teddy bear. I've got one of these guys, they hang them in a cave in Yorkshire, and it's just the right set of conditions, and they form rapidly in just a few months. Fossils don't take millions of years to form, so how can they be evidence for millions of years? This young man 
wrote to us and he said, uh, you're talking to Sam, my work was very important for me becoming a faithful believer in the Bible. I was an atheist convinced of evolution until a year ago and I started to listen to those crazy young earth believers trying to disprove them and here I am now, praise the Lord. He got information he'd never heard before, you see. You don't get that in the public realm. My first trip back to Australia, which was 2012, this young man sought me out at a church in my hometown and he just kept saying, thank you, thank you, and he started to break down and cry. And I said, well, look, email me your testimony and it'll be an encouragement for others. By the way, we have a database in the office. We put all our testimonies in there. There are thousands and thousands. Let me just say something here. I've never, in all my 30 years in ministry, ever heard of, found, know of anybody who became a Christian because they could add evolution in millions of years to the, to the book of Genesis. Think about it. Yeah, yeah. But we have a database with thousands of testimonies of people hearing information that the Bible's history is true as written have come to the Lord. Thank you for your ministry. As a child, a family friend bought me a subscription. You can do that today. You can write up your grandchild and they'll get the magazine or your uh, daughter or son. I attended public schools where evolution is taught, but with the information provided to me through your magazine, my faith was never shaken by evolution. I'm now a Sunday school teacher. My favorite topic is showing God's glory through creation. I attribute your magazine as a major contributor to the strength of my faith and my love of science. A magazine, ladies and gentlemen. So that's why we produce the resources we do. Uh, in a moment, Felix uh, and uh, his helpers are going to come around and give you this sign-up sheet. But let me tell you the way it works. You get the print version, right? Sign up for one year, $29. For two years, it's $50. Now, when you sign up for one or two years, you're going to get the current issue of the magazine. I've got it with me today. You don't have to wait till it's posted. Right? And we're going to give you, we only do this on ministry. You can't get it if you go to our website. We're going to give you the digital version for free. So every three months when it comes out, we send you an email with a link to the digital version. And guess what you can do? You can forward that email. We allow you to use it for evangelism. You can share it with others. Maybe a disbelieving friend at work and he can read it on his own device. We also get our free monthly newsletters. I write most of these. It lets you know what's happening in the US and um, keeps you up to date with breaking news. So sign up for one year. You get the first issue today and you get the free digital version. But if you sign up for two years, which is cheaper, okay, we're going to give you a free DVD. And this is our first documentary we made, 2009, was Darwin's double anniversary. And we retraced his voyage on the Beagle. There were even reenactments when he's on the Galapagos and in South America. And we asked evolutionists and creationists, we asked the question, if Darwin knew today what we know about science, would he have even never been an evolutionist? He knew nothing about the complexity of the cell, for example. But I'm going to give you a second DVD. Think I want you to have the magazine? And this is that survey I did on college campuses in Atlanta. You can hear the students say for themselves. And you know what? You'll see me on there and I say, so you believe in evolution. What's your best evidence that evolution might be true? 90% of them said the fossil record, the fossil record, the fossil record. The next, other, next one was human-chimp DNA similarity. But remember, if I said if there's no millions of years, there's no time for that to happen. Yet the fossil record, ladies and gentlemen, all the rock layers with the fossils in them, that's the easiest thing for us to explain as creationists. We have an eyewitness record of people who survived a global uh, destroying flood. And all over the world, hundreds of tribes and people groups all have, like American Indians and Australian Aboriginals, all their own oral traditions of a watery catastrophe that destroyed the earth and a handful of people were saved. The evidence is everywhere. So you get that two DVDs plus the current issue. So just tick which one you want, one or two years, come to see me and Edmund at the back, put your name and address on there, tick whether you're paying by cash, check or credit card, all right, and we'll give you your free gifts today. So as it comes around, sign up, tear it off, bring it to us at the back and we'll look after you. Now while that's happening, uh, let me show you some of the other resources. Because people come up to me and they say, Gary, I've got a son in college. What would be the best book for him, etc.? By the way, here's some other information from Creation Magazine. The Two-Tone Twins. Mm, are they different races? But they're twins. See, races is a man-made word. 
Remember I said the Bible says of one blood he made all nations and men. There are no different skin colours, by the way. There's just one skin colour. It's a pigment we all have called melanin. Some of us have more of it. Some of us have less. Our DNA codes for it. If you have a lot of melanin, by the way, it acts as a natural sunscreen in hot climates. It's typically why you see lots of dark-skinned people in hot climates. My own country of Australia, our Australian Aboriginals, guess what? After the flood, when people migrated there, fair-skinned people like me would have gone there, but we have the highest rates of skin cancer in the world. So we get knocked out. It's called natural selection. And people with a selection advantage survive better in certain climates than others. That's all it is. It's selection from what God had already created. Adam and Eve, like the parents here, must have been medium brown skin, medium brown hair, medium brown eyes. You get the greatest genetic potential when you're in the medium range. 70% of the world's population today, by the way, has medium brown skin, medium brown hair, medium brown eyes. There's the girls growing up today. See? The Bible's always been right about that. Evolution said no, races evolved independently, but they've caught up through the modern genetics revolution. The Answers book is a key book. Every Christian home should have a copy. 65 of the most asked questions, including what about distant starlight, etc. There's a free study guide. And we put that in a pack along with Refuting Evolution, which is the largest selling creation book of all time, basic high school science. They've all got study guides to them. Geology is the culprit for millions of years. This is one of my favourite books that I edited. And it'll basically, you can do this yourself, you'll learn a lot, but do it with your families and your children. And you'll basically put the right set of glasses on them when they look out at the rocks. They'll see Noah's flood, not millions of years. There's a companion book I co-wrote about dinosaurs. Did Noah get dinosaurs on the ark? Yes, he did. How, did. how did he get them on there? Well, they weren't all big. There's a five hardcover book set, elementary age, designed to be read to a child with parent helps in the back. So Christmas is here soon. So what a great gift. You can see they're all discounted there in packs. And if you wanted one book, if the stuff I said to you today is, oh, old hat Gary, I've heard all that before, one book that covered everything, the Genesis account by Dr. Jonathan Safady is 800 pages of scientific, theological and historical commentary on Genesis 1 to 11. Uh, Noah's flood. Do you realise the world and the continents we had today did not exist before the flood? We live in a post-flood uh, world, etc. And uh, uh, a couple of others. This here is brand new. It's 12 DVDs. It'd be great if someone bought one of these for the church, actually. So you could do these in your Bible studies. Genesis 1 to 11, there's a free study guide. You get online, you can print it out, as many copies as you like. But it takes you through Genesis 1 to 11, step by step, great visuals, great production quality, etc. And lastly, a couple of my DVDs answering that tough question, why does a good God allow bad things? I've heard this is used in prison ministry now. And people have come to the Lord very, very evangelistic. Uh, the first talk in the first service I spoke about was who made God creation restored. We get an idea of what the new heavens and earth are going to be like because of Genesis. And uh, the talk I gave today, I have an expanded two, two DVD version with a study guide if you'd like more information. And this, if you've got teens or you know people that are going to get, go off to college, we co-wrote this booklet called The Creation Survival Guide, How to Survive Education, or how to, grow, how to Graduate with Your Faith Intact. It's basically a list of do's and don'ts. If we understand what our young ones are going to face, then we can better prepare them for that rather than having them ill-equipped to do so. And when I talked about manuscript evidence, we discussed this in this little booklet, How Did We Get Our Bible? And check this out, the inside back cover we did up a chart showing you the 2,800 cross-references in the 66 books of the Bible. It's like a blur, isn't it? Showing the incredible unity of Scripture. And uh, lastly, there's my book. Uh, this is the only creation book to be an Amazon top 50 bestseller. I don't say that to boast, but more non-Christians have read that book. We love science fiction. People are preoccupied with life on other planets. Uh, let me burst your bubble today. God did not create life like us, anywhere else except the earth. Even this in, in this incredibly vast universe is a gospel issue. People are seeing things and they are having experiences. 
called alien abductions, but it's not aliens. And I've been doing this for 20 years and there's been a quantum shift even in the secular UFO movements due to a small segment of Christians like myself who are showing them that the actual evidence of what we see and what happens is spiritual in nature. Evolution cannot account for a spiritual realm, ladies and gentlemen. But the Bible can. And it's always said there's a spiritual realm and we've had visitors from that realm and perhaps you can understand where I'm going. And uh, last year, my board pushed me into making a movie. It's a kind of a, it's documentary, but it's kind of almost science fiction style. Last year, this appeared in over 1,000 theatres around the world, first for a creation ministry. And it was supporters supporting us who helped us do that. And uh, we've had hundreds and hundreds of testimonies. What a great subject to reach the non-believers with, pop culture. And let me leave you with this. I love this passage. Be ready always to give an answer to everyone who asks to give you the reason for the hope that is in you. There's an addition to that. And do this with gentleness and respect. Don't beat people over the head with information. What I do is ask questions. When they come up with an objection, I ask a question. I ask a question. And you'd be surprised how little people know about what they actually profess to believe. And I want to remind you how exciting it is to be a Bible believer this day. There's just a fraction out there on the tables for you this morning. God bless you and thank you, and I'll see you at the end. Thanks very much.